Uh, we're going to call to order and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands for the nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And can I have a motion to appoint Terry Howard, District Clerk Pro Tem, for today's board meeting? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And can I have a motion to approve the present agenda as written? Motion. Um, before I call for votes, um, we do have uh, an executive session with an expert um, scheduled for um, 7 p.m. If it seems like um, the agenda runs long, um, what we will do is uh, pause um, wherever we are and then we'll amend to go into executive session early and then we'll, we'll finish the meeting if needed. Um, but I think, I think we've got plenty of time to get through today's agenda. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And we are in the first of two public comment periods. Um, this first public comment period is for stakeholders of the Chatham Central School District to speak about um, issues pertaining to today's agenda. Um, there will be a second public comment period at the end of the meeting, which will be for any issues pertaining to the district. But if someone um, either online or in person um, would like to speak about today's agenda, um, raise your physical or digital hand using the button at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will give you a couple minutes to speak. What's our attendee count? Two. Two. Any digital hands? We'll just present. We'll just wait one moment longer. No hands. Okay. We're going to move into uh, board member comment. Um, do any board members um, have anything to uh, to table in terms of what's going on right now? Beth, right. can you pass Beth the microphone? Um, I was a little concerned about the reactions that we got on Facebook today about the electric buses. And I think maybe we need to discuss a little further um, the reason behind our, our thoughts of going that in those directions, um, where we are at, any of the grants that might be out there, um, because we've had those, those are just my concerns. Okay. Um, maybe we'll come back to that during um, items for future agenda. Um, and um, we could spend uh, a minute or two deciding uh, what might be required at that time. Uh, do we, we have that item on today's agenda or is it? It's not here, is it? Oh, yeah, we do. After consensus agenda. So we'll circle back on that. Sounds good. Anyone else? Okay. Well, uh, with that, not not a twenty minute uh, wait, Mike. Um, we're going to start with the technology update um, from Mike Olson. Well, Sal's bringing that up. I just I want to take the time to uh, really thank you for bringing me on board. Um, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm really excited about not only what we're doing right now, um, but what we're planning to do. And you'll see in this uh, fairly brief presentation some of those things. Um, so without further ado, Sal, if you want to jump to the next one, please. So the next three slides after this are about specific um, projects that we worked on things that we're working on that are security related, um, things that we are, uh, that improved our security 
posture on our systems in the district and, and the network. Um, so first one's just it's antivirus. Um, when I came on board in June, we, we were using antivirus on the computers here. Um, and by computers, I don't mean Chromebooks because Chromebooks, um, they're handled differently. Um, but Windows computers, and we had about 250 computers that were using uh, what, what comes with Windows, and that's that's not very good. It's it's okay, but it wasn't great. So we made some changes there. I'm going to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> we just installed a new wireless system, which is um, much better than the one that was in place. Um, also, there are some security um, aspects to that that I'll talk about. And the third piece is um, last March, almost to, to, the, to the day um, or to the month, um, Questar did a cybersecurity assessment for us. And when I came on board, I, I was presented with that, started to digest that, digest that information and work on some of the uh, more important items there. So Sal, if you wanna go to the next one, we'll talk about antivirus. Um, so we, we purchased a product called CrowdStrike, which is, um, it's, it's a next generation antivirus. Uh, it's cloud-based. Um, so the old antivirus software um, was okay at the time. It was what we what we would use. So that they had uh, static definitions of what viruses and what malware were out there on the internet. So every day it would get updated, and then the next day all you would have to you'd have to install that update on all the computers and on your management server, and it would be it was very sort of static. This new antivirus is um, it's machine learning. It's uh, it's it's. It, it knows about attacks before they happen. It, it, it can learn it. Um, so it's not, it's not static, it's out in the cloud and it's way better than what we had before. Um, we actually partnered with, we have what's called 24 seven managed detection and response. So by that, I mean, we've got a company Aspire in New Jersey that is monitoring um, any alerts that come in. And if we get anything, um, they send an email if it's not a critical alert. They send an email to a distribution list that all of our techs get and see and I see, and then we can act upon that. If it were to be something critical in nature, um, that workstation that was infected would be automatically quarantined and taken off the network, and I would get a phone call. Um, and we, we haven't decided yet, and I need to talk to district leadership about this, um, who else wants to receive those phone calls um, and, and maybe notified, but... Um, we're in a position to to avoid disaster um, on our endpoints, which when I when I came on board, it was a concern of mine. Um, it's on all of our computers, all of our servers. They're protected. Um, and another concern was, you know, if you could bring in a flash drive and it can have, you know, a virus on it. Students bring in a flash drive and it can it can go sideways very quickly. This software is on every every computer that can receive a flash drive and could potentially impact our systems and our network, and it scans it. So there's a there's an agent that runs on the computer and it scans it, and if there's anything bad, it takes care of it right right then and there. So I think we're in a much better position in this regard uh, from a security standpoint. Um, next, please. So uh, the wireless system. Um, when I came on board, we had um, one wireless network with a pre-shared key that everyone has known for a long time. And uh, that is a major se uh, security concern. Uh, it's been keeping me up at night. So we actually just implemented a, a new system. There's an access point up there. The team worked over a holiday recess and installed all of these things. This was an E-rate purchase from last year, but we had some supply chain issues. And we just received all of the hardware, the rest of the access points this fall. And so we plan to do it and it's, it's installed. And um, so it, it's a much better system. It can handle higher volume of computers. Um, you can easily go from one room to you know, one part of the building or one part of the district to the next without losing your connection. Um, and one of the things, the second uh, item on there about personal devices that, that can, has concerned me is that uh, student devices or any personal device, whether it's student or staff, um, was everyone knew the password, it would just get on our network. And it's on the same, same network and had the same access as our computers. Uh, that has changed. So we have set it up so that these personal devices do still have access. We're gonna discuss as a group, and, and Matt, you and I were talking about this, uh, 
what we should do about personal devices on the district network. But what we did do was we we didn't shut them off, but we we made it so they only have access to the internet and nothing else. So by that I mean my phone in my pocket, if I'm on if I'm on this wireless, I can't I only have internet access. I don't it's not inward facing. You can't get access to any of our servers or any sensitive data. You just there's a policy on the new wireless system that prevents that. Uh, and that that's a big change. So the the, the wireless is um is much more secure and um it's better than the old one was. So, and next one, please. So regarding the, the cybersecurity assessment, there the, there were a lot of um, different line items on this assessment, but we, we focused on the critical and high ones. Um, so we, we have fixed most of the critical and high vulnerabilities, probably 95% of them, um, maybe even 100% at this point, but things like patching patching software installing updates for hardware things like that we've done that um one of the things that one of the first things i did when i came on board the help desk folks harris wall and trish and even aaron perry uh, from Questar, our techs they were logging onto their computers with their with an account that had high level uh administrative access to systems on our network so that if their workstations were compromised it could go sideways and, and a hacker or a bad actor could take control of our, our systems and our networks very easily. Almost The first week I was here, we changed that. So we created a separate account. They don't log into the computer with it. But when they need to do administrative work on any systems or the network or anything like that, or and, and in Google, they use that separate account. So if no one should be logging onto a computer with local administrative access, because that is that is the first step in in being compromised and having a real bad situation. So that that really improved our security posture. We got rid of Windows Seven machines almost without exception. You know, with uh, onto Windows Ten, uh, and that last one is network segmentation. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but we will do that. So by that I mean, we've got computers and printers and phones and security cameras. And I'm uh, missing one of them. Uh, HVAC systems, you name it, all kinds of different systems with different functions, right? They shouldn't be on the same network for several reasons. One reason is that it 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 bogs down the network unnecessarily. So if you you can you can segment that and make it more efficient, uh, it also re really reduces risk. So if a, a hacker theoretically could gain access to a security camera that's on on the same network as our servers or something else. And if they do, then, and, and it's not segmented from the rest of the network, it's trouble for us. But we are going to segment that. That's high on the list of things we're gonna do. Next. So these are just some general updates. Um, some of my humor that's from the IT crowd. It's a British. Um, show um anyway um so one of the things we did uh with the help desk team is we we last year we had um patrick uh, and he he left us um i can't remember the details of how that went down to be honest with you lisa i'm looking in your direction because you know but um we we brought on aaron perry an extra two days a month. So he's here three days a week. He was, he was, you know, he was here Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday. Now he's here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that has helped tremendously. Aaron's been here a long time and he does great work. Um, the number there, we, we've had 1,327 help desk tickets come in this year. There were 1,457 last year, same time frame. So team has been pretty busy. The, the next line item there is Chromebooks. Um, we had a, a fleet of Chromebooks that weren't going to work. And I found out about it in July. And um, we, we managed to secure 450 new Chromebooks and deploy them by the start of school. Um, that was a, um, a great task. Um, but to, to the point about the service tickets, those, one of the biggest things we deal with and what I'd like to discuss um, at a future date is a policy regarding um, repairs. 
we've got lost chargers, we've got broken screens, things like that. And we're having a hard time keeping up. We're trying because the bottom line is we need the students to be able to do what they need to do. And we certainly you know, are doing our best, but uh, I'd like to talk about the potential of a, um, a policy in that regard. So more to come on that. We did install five new um, large displays like the one here in classrooms, which was, which was nice. Um, and we also put in as part of the wireless project, which was the E-Ray project from last year, we, in each building, there's now a network sensor, which is a tool we can use to gain insight into what's going on and for troubleshooting, um, or just in general to just look at some, some trends and, and make sure everything's working okay. It can, it can alert us to potential issues before they even happen. Um, so that, that was, a, that's a good thing too. And then the next, uh, next slide is about, you know, the roadmap for the future. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be implementing SysCloud, which is uh, Google comes with what's called Google Vault. It's very basic. Uh, it does back up some of your data. Uh, the retention period is 30 days for, for things uh, that are, um, for example, if someone leaves the district and they request their data on the 31st day, we can't get it for them using Google's um, built-in tools. SysCloud um, has unlimited backups, retention. Um, furthermore, it actually has a tool that will analyze the data that you're backing up and check for potential of ransomware. Uh, it'll check for compliance, IEP compliance, FERPA compliance, things like that. It's a, it's a Cadillac of a product. It's, it's tremendous. And the next one is ClassLink, which we are looking to uh, move to. That is a um, that's for students to have a, a single single source for all the digital tools that they use, websites, uh, apps, things like that. Uh, Google everything in one place with one password. Um, one of the greatest parts about that is it'll have a single source, uh, so it'll be uh, either school tool or, in our case, for staff, we could be um, what is it, WinCap. And and when someone leaves the district, a student graduates, they're they're going to it's going to automatically get rid of that account. Right now, we're doing it manually, and it's not the best way to do it. Same with staff; that's a big one. Staff leaves if there's not um, if we're not notified somehow, it gets dropped. It doesn't happen, but this will happen automatically. So if a staff member leaves in a win cap that is reflected, it they just won't have access anymore. That's a big one. Um, and the, over the summer, we're going to consolidate our servers. We have um, a lot of servers and it's using a lot more energy and costing us money that we um, can save and will save by consolidating some of those services and virtualizing them so that there's less hardware to be used. Um, and it'll also be more efficient uh, for how we, how we do things here. Um, cameras is, is, is on the list because there are certain areas, especially in the middle school I've noticed that um, there's some hallways that could use cameras and there are no cameras, uh, as far as I know, on the outside of the buildings, uh, which I'd like to, I'd like to see. Um, for wireless, uh, future plan, BYOD and guest networks, something we, we need to discuss as a group and come up with a plan, but we can do it very safely and securely with the new system that we put in place. Um, so we want to be very thoughtful about how we how we do that. Um, another thing that keeps me up at night is uh, sharing of sensitive data. Right now, um, I'm not sure uh, everyone does it a different way. I think we we try to do it in a secure way, but you could. There's a service called Secure FTP, which you can. Um, it's encrypted. You have to have a login. You can share it that way, and it's very very safe. Uh, I'm going to look to implement something uh, either through Questar or um, elsewhere to do that sooner rather than later, hopefully. Um, we need to upgrade upgrade the door release systems at the MED and the high school, the middle school. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is there anyone here from the middle school? Brett, yes. The, the door systems are pretty good, uh, right? They're, they're in good shape there. So at the high school and the elementary school, there are some um, old systems in place for, you know, when a visitor comes and release the door and we, we have some uh, ideas about how to make that better too. And uh, the last thing here is VPN remote access, meaning a perfect example of this is winter's here. And uh, in order to work on the HVAC system, either we have to have someone sit at a computer and share their screen and be on a Zoom like we are right now, which is not a great idea and, and not really feasible in every, uh, you know, especially if it's a weekend or something. 
um, or someone has to come on site, we we can make it so that they can connect remotely using a, a virtual private network uh, tunnel that is safe and secure. Um, and that's that. Sure, I rambled a little. Thank you for hanging in there. Any questions? I know that was a lot of information. I want to reiterate, by the way, that especially those future initiatives, very excited about some of those things. There, there does, um, well, things were in very good shape when I came on board. Uh, Sal used the term, the ship was certainly not sinking. I'm very excited about making improvements and I'm just so grateful to be here. So thank you. I can help um, with a couple of clarifications. One, um, Patrick, and um, Aaron comprised um, a FT of 2.5 last year. And after an, uh, analyzing our, our needs, we um, uh, increased that service through BOCES for 3.0. Patrick, um, being a BOCES employee, was assigned to another district and we were able to um, have Aaron do the full 3.0. So that's where that change came Thank in. You. So, yeah. Yeah, my, my understanding is um, the generation of Chromebooks that we had had reached their uh, end of useful life. Uh, it could no longer uh, connect to the um, Google um, console. Correct? Right. It, it's it's a it's a planning issue, which I plan to resolve. Um, you know, every year you should have, you should plan for a replacement cycle so that you don't ever reach that point where you need that many. I, we, I, when I came in, we just had that number. So it hadn't been cared for, but part of like, for example, those 450 Chromebooks that were just purchased in 2022, they are going to, I made sure to buy them so that they last seven, a full seven years, which is longer than the previous ones were done. And, and, and they should be able to handle that. And then we'll just, we'll, we'll build in a, put together a plan so that we don't have to buy. Well, yes. And so last year we, we tried one, one way of dealing with the Chromebooks and, and letting the students take them. Um, and that, I don't think that worked out well. So I think it will be better. I think we're this year, what we're going to do is have them be returned, go through them. We, we have in, student interns every summer. Um, and and then because there was it was a bit of a mess in the beginning of the school year and I'm sure the principals who are anyone who's here would you know understand that but I, I think there's a couple other extenuating factors that I'm and I'm just putting kind of some pieces together one is uh during the pandemic we scrambled to get devices out to students however and whichever way we could um we had a, a, a larger than expected um incidental accident occurrence. They were in people's homes for quite a length of time. And so I, I, I do know that we experienced a, a higher than normal um, breakage rate. Um, Mike also alluded to the fact that, you know, it's always, it's been a quandary for a decade now. You're, you're mandating the use of technologies within the school. And um, at, at some point, the district is providing a device and we're making it so that it's required to participate in a class or in with whichever activity. Um, some schools have dabbled with um, holding students more accountable for breakage, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a it's a tough uh, it's a tough nut to crack because if the student needs it to uh, complete their academic uh, activities they can't be held hostage that you're waiting for them to reimburse the district for a keyboard or a screen. And so what a lot of districts unfortunately have migrated to is just kind of rolling in all those costs into kind of a total cost of ownership model. But at some point, um, and, and I, I may be misspeaking because I don't work in this day to day, it gets to the point where we have some frequent flyers, right? Things happen, people put pencils in between their Chromebooks, they shut the Chromebook, people drop them, things happen and we know that. But we do probably and likely have um, frequent flyers. When you're on your third Chromebook, um, that becomes the inability for somebody to potentially take care of something that doesn't belong to them. So there's always room for improvement. I think also a little bit to do with our transition from our previous um, you know, senior network 
network systems technician to Mike, we had a gap of time. So, you know, Mike's coming in. Um, I know he felt when he first got here, it was a little bit like a fire hose. There was a lot of things for him to learn and try to get his head around. Um, one of the conversations that we had was focused on this first slide. Um, you probably, it'd be no surprise to you that you see in the national news that K through 12 schools are probably among the top targets of cyber uh, instances, um, you know, uh, nationwide. And, you know, that's coming out of the FBI and Homeland Security. And we had some vulnerabilities that needed to be um, addressed. We learned from the misfortune of other districts. And, you know, at, at first, when you see 24 seven or remote monitoring, you say, for us, that's crazy. Well, if I were to go in more detail and not tonight, um, with some of the cyber attacks that have happened in local districts, which have crippled them or caused them hundreds of thousands of dollars in um, data recovery and you know um, security incidents, they potentially can happen overnight, and they weren't. They sometimes aren't discovered till the next morning or well into the next day. And so, in any cyber, and Mike, Matt, Matt could probably speak more eloquently to this than me. The sooner you isolate or um, quarantine the the infected computer and you deal with the situation, the the better chance you have at minimizing the impact. So, just a couple, you know, kind of anecdotal things. Um, I, I, it, I just yeah. want to add to the notes about the the fleet. Um, so the, the fleet of machines, right? We've got like a thousand Chromebooks out there or whatever. Um, there probably was some fleet management issues um, preceding COVID that could have been more mature. But remember that these devices moved from being an educational aid to becoming required critical learning tools over overnight during COVID. And at the same time, that was true for every other company on the planet. And there were simply not enough laptops to go around the world. Um, and not only did maybe we buy some laptops that were not great, but um, I can tell you, I had five kids with Chromebooks. Some of them were literally taped together because there was no parts to replace them. We, we had a number of Chromebooks. I don't know what the count was, a big percentage of the fleet. You wouldn't wish anyone to use these things, but they had to because we literally couldn't order replacements. So we probably had a year and a half or two years of catch-up acquisitions that were in this batch, right? Does that sound right? Yeah, that does. I have a very um, general question because I don't understand cybersecurity and all this stuff. So um, I'll try to ask it as uh, general as possible and maybe, you know, you can help me sort of zero in on a better question. But in terms of like ransomware, which we've always, we've all heard about, Sal, you, you touched about it. Um, these these newer upgrades that you've touched upon, like, does that protect us in a way that, like, we're sort of good, we're good, we think we're good? Like, what's what level of protection are we talking about? They're best practices, um, and I will say that the the endpoint protection is a, is was a great start. Um, that that that's and segmenting the network. I talked about segmenting. It's just taking. Um, you know, an HVAC system shouldn't be on the same network as a server that has critical data. It won't be. So if that HVAC system, which isn't always, they're not always the best devices for getting updated or they're just, they're just not capable of maybe having being protected like we'd want them to be, but they're critical to the function of the district. They're separate. If it gets attacked, it can't go anywhere. It can't go, can't infect anything else. So the likelihood of uh, you know a ransomware viruses that would would do damage is much lower when we implement these things, and a lot of them are already in place. Um, and I have many more ideas about it. I mean, this is these are the most important ones to implement, but you know it's a it's a, it's a marathon. We'll get there. I just want to add something for context here. Um, uh, these guys all know I'm in cyber. Um, schools were ignored by attackers for a number of years because they weren't very juicy targets. Um, the rest of the world has sort of hardened their surfaces. They protected themselves. They have alarm systems. They put locks on their doors and windows. And schools, unfortunately, are one of a few soft targets left out there. And when you're an attacker and you're just looking for the easy targets, unfortunately, as of uh, the last 12 months or so, that's schools. Um, you, you may have heard that last year and the year before it was municipalities, 
right? Um, schools are getting hit very hard right now. And anything you can do to harden the surface will make you a less attractive target, but also um, limit what they call the blast area. Um, I, I can almost guarantee that um, there are ac active infections in this building right now that are undetected. And they're detected. It, it's they're, poor, they're contained. You're, you're <laughs> right. I just checked. They're low, they're low but they're, they're yeah. adware. They're things that aren't you know, terrible, but they, they exist. So you're right. Yeah, they're, they're here. And so finding them is, is required, but you're never going to find all of them. And that's where um, that monitoring becomes necessary. And whether it's eight by five or 24 by seven, the important thing is that there's humans in charge of that are experts. We're never going to hire those experts that are in charge of analyzing that because um, it, 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 it takes weeks for an attacker to break in, figure out how they're going to extract value out of a network. Um, you can catch them during that period. You can catch them during that period. You don't have to wait until the, a bomb goes off. Um, and an antivirus isn't good enough. You need a, a team someplace. I can't speak about this vendor, but um, but that is the, the best practice. And, and every organization of this size needs to be doing that if they're going to have functioning IT. I can give you a, one example of this that I think will help. Um, uh, all of our servers have a um, Barracuda backup agent software that runs, that backs up, that pauses activity on the server, basically, and just takes all that data and puts it somewhere else. It moves it to another another area and then backs it up to the cloud. CrowdStrike detected that and blocked it and said, I don't like what's happening here. And so what we what we had to do, and I was notified, and that morning we we went through that, verified that it was what we wanted it to be, that it was safe, and whitelisted it. But if it was a nefarious attack, it wouldn't have happened because it stopped it. So that so just sort of the forward question from there would be, uh, moving forward, you know, two years from now, five years from now. Is is the because you had mentioned this is machine learning, right? Um, is this something that's just going to automatically get better, or we have to like? No, it it it, it is automatic. It's CrowdStrike's, um, you know, software in the cloud. It's it it it's it it just happens automatically. To answer your question, it's not anything we need to do. Back in the day, you had to go out and get an update and install it. You know, it, it just happens automatically. That's um, great. And it's all it's all in the cloud. And while Fred is queuing up the microphone, the, the other aspect of all cybersecurity is the human element that Matt mentioned. You know, uh, we, we have some work to do in terms of just plain uh, staff understanding not to supply usernames and passwords and all the phishing schemes and, and such that are out there. Those are equally as, as disconcerting. But if a staff person were to fall victim to that, then we have these products in place to try to catch the, the issue. And what that was also alluding to is students have become tremendously rich targets, mainly because accessing their personal information at a time when they may not be monitoring that information is very valuable to a uh, to a to a bad we call bad actors. So I, yeah, go ahead. Two uh, two thoughts, I or questions, or perhaps I had um, based on Chris's comment about forward thinking, so, and this is. It's going to be a curveball. It's not intended to be a curveball, so I don't need an answer right now. <laughs> uh, but OpenAI just released ChatGPT, and they went from zero to a million members in five days. Perspective, Instagram got there in eight years. So this is artificial intelligence. It's constantly learning. It's machine learning. What is there to do about that? Because I know it's, I know there's these apps out there that just don't work, um, and so that's a consideration. I think the the board has to sort of take an an advanced progressive approach to whatever that might be. So I'm looking at Matt with his yeah, background I, and and our guy here. Well, I I I I think, and if you've got some thoughts, please share them. But I'd like to share the fact that I think that um, that discussion is probably something that dis that belongs in inside the administrative team because um, as a person that encounters AI frequently, mm -hmm. I would say I'm more concerned with how how is this advancement useful 
to our academic teams. And, 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 and it's not, not so, necessarily a, a problem for the IT department to consider. So one of the things that just happened with that, and, and I agree, I come with this from an academic standpoint, and I'm like, okay, how, how do we incorporate this? How do we combat cheating on it? But that's even the least of it. How do we use it? The flip side of it is that you can use it to bypass its own program. Uh, this was done recently in an experiment. And so if our security stone walls or firewalls are working, how do you develop a system that responds rapidly to a system that's responding rapidly to the growth? Um, and we may not know that. I do think that it's part of the educational process that I want to see you get, which brings me to the second question. Um, what kind of professional development, Sal, are we offering our IT staff in-house and through Questar or the NERIC network so that we are as front of the spear, point of the spear as possible? Well, NERIC, NERIC's done an amazing job of offering um, cybersecurity um, training. And uh, we had a team um, just prior to the pandemic or just, just after the pandemic, um, Dr. Rood, uh, my Chuddy, Giles, myself, Harris, we participated in one of their first um, cybersecurity roundtables, and yeah, we began the process of developing a cybersecurity uh, response, crit critical response plan. And um, I know Mike is working on um, either going the 20th or the 27th with a team. Right. I actually had that on my slides and took oh, it off last night. I, I didn't decide. No, I don't. It's not up there. Oh. We are going to be. Um, Picking that back up and developing a cyber cyber incident response plan um, with a, a RACI chart, you know, people who are responsible and, and accountable. And I can't remember the other one. Yes, I'll right. my head. But anyway, it's um, something we need to put in place. So I think what Matt was alluding to is this environment, this um, landscape is changing so quickly that a small IT shop like Chatham or even a region uh, doesn't have the resources to keep up with it. So we rely very heavily on um, our, our Questar colleagues and, and importantly, there because they have a broader reach to help um, help us mitigate um, all of these different um, aspects and um, very thankful. Um, we're also an aspect of that, not to get, wasn't expected to do kind of a deep dive on this, but you know, the, our cybersecurity insurance is another aspect of something that Mike has, as a result of us participating in those activities, has taken a closer look at. And we've, um, you know, bolstered that up because one of the best practices is that if an incident were to occur, not all cybersecurity liability is created equal. And we want to make sure that we're covered for a variety of different types of responses um, because there's a lot of responsibility. As you know, if you've received um, credit monitoring or any identity um, monitoring from any one of your uh, vendors in the past, there's a lot of liability when it comes to a breach in terms of notification to state ed and also with um, our obligation to our end users. So those are things that we need other experts to help us navigate. I, I, yeah, I I'm, I'm absolutely agree with you and understand that. I, I think, though, like, Mike, you hit the curveball. Because... Yeah. What I, I, I didn't know that it was what I was looking for, what I wanted to hear about, what I wanted us to be thinking about is similar to if we had a violent, you know, crisis or mm -hmm. incident. And it sounds like you're talking about a cyber response team, like we would talk about a response team for, and that, that to me sounds like the right type of thinking. I don't know what it looks like. That's I'll show you. We'll, we'll show you sometimes. Good. We yeah. have also, um, Narek um, does have a, a, a newly created information security team. Um, with one of the smartest people I've, I I know in information security at Narek. Um, I used to work there, of course. So next a little to Matt. bit biased. Um, next to Matt, of course. Um, I don't know Matt well, so I said I know. <laughs> um, but really, there, we 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 have a lot of resources um, and are are working on a plan for sure. And, and not to belabor the issue, but you know, it some of this is uh, we benefit from the templates that Narek has created because a lot of us are challenged with the same issues. So as districts, we can come together. Um, that the last time we went, what was really encouraging is that um, a, 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 su a superintendent or assistant superintendent was encouraged to join all the teams, and we were uh, physically present in a large room where we could also share information amongst districts, which was very useful. And uh, so, uh, so I this was a very technical presentation so i'm not going to add any more technical questions but um i'm curious um 
This last assessment, March 2022, do we have a 23 assessment scheduled? We do not. Okay. Certainly can do that. We do have items that still need to be addressed, not the critical and high ones, but other things that should be taken care sure. of. Sure. But I like the idea of, of just, you know, penetration testing, things like that. I, the more the merrier. Let, let's see what our vulnerabilities are so we know what they are and we can fix them. So. And then the, the follow-up, um, did they do a NIST CSF assessment? Do we know what – was there an actual um, standard that they were assessing us against? Who did the assessment? Was it self-assess? No, self Questar. Questar. When we purchased the uh, Zscaler, uh, we bundled it with a complete security assessment. They have a CSO? Was that – they they had some kind of service there. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, you know they, I I, I can share that. I have I have that. The, that the policy that we implemented was for an annual assessment, so it would it would be oh. good to see um, okay. that we have that scheduled sometime during the twenty three calendar. Okay. Um, I don't have any other. You know, I we could, we could geek out together, but I don't I don't have any other questions for this guy. You guys, uh, any other tech questions? Okay. We tried to keep it tech light. Um, Mike will be back with Mr. Chuddy during uh, the budget season, so we can. If we can get um, once you have fleshed out a little bit, even uh, I don't need to. I don't even think we should put out a detail necessarily, but what that response team structure might look like. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see that. In the presentation. Okay. Um. I. <laughs> If we're going to be presenting um, the response team, um, I think there are elements of that type of thing that would have to be covered under executive session. Oh. Yeah. I, I see it very um, synonymous to the security briefing I'm, I'm planning for the 24th, um, something similar to that where we, because there there are certain aspects of that plan that should not be divulged in public. So, yeah. At attackers can and do use... Uh, they they will scan our board minutes. Of course. <laughs> um, I th I think we're ready for um, a report from our student representative. Mike, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, um, to start off on a on a not so high note, midterms are coming up. It's, I think it's on. You just need, on. that one. You need to be a little closer. That's all. Okay. Midterms are coming up. However, we are going to be hosting a test taking skills, tips, and tricks workshop. I think that was hosted today in the library. And then next Tuesday, we're doing a seminar on test anxiety. These are both led by our school psychologist, Ms. Susa Donovan. Um, and I know she's very enthusiastic about them. She, it's something that she said she's seen a need for um, in school in general. And so she's excited to bring that to, um, to chat up. Um, as we head to midterm season. So the senior class also prior to um, our winter recess adopted a senior citizen through donations. We were able to not only purchase gifts that she had listed on her list, um, but also purchase two price shopper gift cards for families in our community that were in need. At the last board meeting, we had just finished um, Krispy Kreme. We had just finished collecting orders. We ended up having over $700 in profit um, so that was a fairly successful year for us. Um, and then those were delivered December 19th, I believe. Um, I also mentioned that we were going to be doing a volleyball game and dance. Those are going to be on January 28th. Tickets for the dance are going to be sold during lunch periods and are going to be $10 each. And it will be held in the cafeteria at 7 p.m. And then volleyball game tickets will be sold at the door that day. I think we have four games scheduled. Um, classes versus each other and then a championship. And then we're doing the varsity football team versus the vol varsity volleyball team. So that one should be interesting. Um, sports are in full swing, as most of you probably have realized. There is a basketball game happening in our gym currently. Um, and I know boys are at home again on Friday. And then we also are going to be having our Panther Pride Day on February 4th. And I believe we are planning to do a spirit week beforehand. Very concise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gracie. Does anyone have questions on uh, current events? I didn't get any donuts. That's my comment. Unfortunately, that one is out of my control. <laughs> um, okay. 
we can move on into um, superintendent's update. Thank you. Um, Gracie, I apologize. I was reading some notes. Did you mention the Pops concert next, the 18th as well? No. Okay, no. All right, good. Uh, so don't forget the Pops concert will be on January 18th here at the high school. Yes. I'm pretty sure, well, you know, that's a good question. I'll, okay. I know last year we, we moved it to the auditorium, correct? Um, a couple uh, a couple notes, uh, 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 noteworthy things. Um, in regard to the capital project, um, our communication and marketing efforts are well uh, underway uh, as a result of the board approving uh, the design and moving forward with the referendum on uh, December 13th that um, kicked in many different activities in, into action. Uh, we are um, in, the, in the moment finishing up, we have finished up um, the content to the newsletter that's at the um, layout and designers. We're hoping to have that back for proof tomorrow and off to the printers um, at the end of this week. So that would be um, available uh, for mailing sometime next week. Uh, we're right on target with the projection of that being uh, mailed out somewhere around the 20th in, in uh, taxpayers' hands um, shortly thereafter. Um, Mike and I um, went to um, a recent meeting of the Lions Club in Chatham to um, review the capital project presentation and, and, and solicit feedback. Um, there were probably close to 20 uh, individuals. Um, we were very thankful to, in the generous gift of listening to us uh, about, tell about the project for about an hour and field questions and concerns uh, from them. We um, are also um, knee deep in the production of the video. Uh, we're, we've um, uh, videotaped or we've taped all of the um, video footage. Um, we have the final script and the post-production probably will begin um, tomorrow or the next day. And again, um, we hope to see a first draft of that early next week with the final version being available for distribution uh, on, uh, on target for the end of next week. As a reminder, we have scheduled one more public information session. It'll take place on uh, January 23rd uh, here on a Monday night here um, at the um, high school. We'll begin here very similar to what we did back in November. And uh, that will be an overview of the project followed by questions and answers and then a brief tour of some of the facilities that we're proposing be upgraded uh, as part of the capital project here at the high school. Um, we also produced a nice display banner uh, that is already off to the printers and we expect it back this week. We will be placing that at strategic locations within the community. Um, I'm hopeful to approach uh, several businesses and those will be available for display in our schools and in some of our area, um, not only businesses, but social organizations. So um, our facilities committee has seen a proof of that. I may have also included that in the Friday report. Uh, we're very pleased with the way that turned out. Again, that's a collaborative effort between our uh, architects, SEI design and Adam Charbonneau, our, our communication specialist. Um, I'm willing to, or I, got, I have one more update I wanna do, but uh, if anybody has any questions in terms of the capital project, I'd be happy to um, address those. Um, moving on to um, yeah, what, something that Beth had mentioned, uh, something that admittedly caught us a little bit off guard. Um, we posted uh, what we thought was a very um, benign um, uh, post uh, regarding our um, exploration of um, electric buses. Um, I want to you know, reassure not only the board, but the community that this is just the first of a very preliminary uh, beginning of investigation into a myriad of, of different aspects of um, and details regarding electric buses. Uh, I, I'm encouraged by the active um, interaction that has occurred on social media, but I also, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is quite a bit of uh, work ahead of us. Um, one of the things that has precipitated our looking into this and investigating this technology, as you know, was the fact that the governor came out um, at the beginning of 22 and then eventually uh, in, in April made it um, official that um, no all new school buses starting in the year 2027 will have to be zero emission or electric. Um, that's something that has been made very clear. 
we don't know whether that's a straight out mandate or if the lever is the fact that you would not receive any reimbursement on buses that were not zero emission. But in any way, the information that we have um, uh, researched says that all buses for schools will have to be purchased after 2027 would have to be electric with the goal that has been currently set that the entire school fleet across the state would be fully electrified by 2035. It, it is certainly an ambitious goal. Um, and and we know that there's a myriad of of concerns and considerations that will have to be addressed before uh, you know we we move head, uh, head full full steam ahead with this. Um, I um, we we have a ton of ongoing meetings. We have meetings with our architects. We have meetings with our consultants. We have meetings with different um, bus companies. And again, this is truly, and, and the reason for that post was to demonstrate that we're doing our due diligence to investigate uh, and be well informed about our decision making. Um, as you know, this, this district among several in the capital region, uh, we're fortunate to be named in an EPA uh, grant. Um, which would assist us in potentially purchasing the first few electric buses. Um, we are still investigating whether um, that is feasible for us or not. And at this juncture, it is just too premature to be able to give you enough information to make that determination. Um, my suggestion is in the coming weeks uh, and months, we'll be much better positioned to come to the board and share with you all of the information that we have discovered. And then we can um, make a recommendation as to how we would like to move forward forward. Um, I know if you, you know, if you read some of the um, social media posts, there's, there's, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, information that is not necessarily accurate. Um, yes, a electric bus costs anywhere from two to three times that of a diesel, but um, there's also cost savings associated with um, switching over to electric versus um, diesel fuel. However, we also know that there's capacity issues with electrical, with the grid, and and there's just so there's probably more unanswered questions than there are uh, answers to the questions at the present time. So um, I'm I'm more than happy to entertain. Um, some preliminary questions, but we, we really do need the luxury of some time to get our head around this before we can um, really overreact to um, to anything. Uh, go ahead. Just in terms of the time frame, like, do you think before end of year we might have a... Oh, oh. Um, you know, we're hopeful that we're going to need to make a decision as to whether we participate in that grant sometime uh, in April. So okay. my hope is that end of February, um, we so will. That's, that's soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, you know, th if you think about the purpose of the grant, um, it would be to allow us to potentially um, create a proof of concept. You know, a, a, a lot of what was brought forth in the postings is accurate. Um, you know, the buses only go a certain range. They go less of a range um, in the winter when you're using the heater. Um, you know, we've got terrain to worry about. We have charging cycles. So we've got, um, you know, there are safety um, considerations with local uh, fire departments, whether they're equipped to handle uh, issues that might come up with electric vehicles in general, let alone electric buses. And so we're cognizant of everything that was brought to our attention. And we just are urging for some patience uh, and understanding as we become better informed and um, uh, can be able to be better address our recommendation to, to the board as to whether we should move forward or not. We are not looking to replace 20 buses tomorrow, um, but we very well may be looking to do a proof of concept with a couple smaller buses. And we'd like to do so potentially because the funding would be there and there'd be little tax impact, um, potentially little tax impact uh, to the to the taxpayers. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so will that consideration also include um, any necessary improvements to or the electric service? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a must. Okay. Uh, improvements. So we would like to better understand what the capacity, our current electrical service has the capacity to do. You know, for instance, could it do four buses right now? Um, you know, what is the, what can the current capacity be? Um, there are elements like and we're, we're brought up in the post, um, uh, maintenance, 
You know, what are the ramifications in terms of our facility, our personnel, training, warranty on batteries, life expectancy? Um, we There's a, a pretty long laundry list of things that we need to address. So I, I <laughs> we need to move on because we, we we do have a time schedule to meet. Um, but I want to add here, um, I, I was originally planning to, to kick this into a future meeting, but I, I think we're going to have that future update. Um, but just as a an overall reminder to our board here, our job is... Um, to be um, academic and f fiduciary um, oversight for the school. Um, what, what we're seeing here are a series of carrot and stick measures from state government, federal government, and it's it's happening across all states. This isn't just a New York thing, um, you know, and it's happening at the federal level. And we should be in position to um, benefit from those carrots. Um, to, to lower um, the tax impact of any future mandates, those sticks. Um, and to do that, we need to start researching and take advantage of grants um, when we can um, and, and otherwise do the, the best thing we can for the taxpayers. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in February, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, superintendent update? Okay, we're going to move on into policy update um, and Pat, I'm seeing here that um, we do have some draft policies, but they didn't make it into public comment. So we'll have to do a first reading at a future meeting. We're not ready for first. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, all that makes sense. Um, and so it sounds like uh, there's going to be a period of, a, of at least a few months here where you guys are actively working through um, a first pass and we're probably not going to see readings until you at least make it end to end. And then presuming you get to like draft stage where we're ready to do uh, readings we may be in the summertime at that point. May it doesn't really matter. But 
Yeah, we we also need to be, of course, wary of um, the public's opportunity to review um, these policies. So as we're giving the board extra time to be able to understand and ask questions as you're going through, um, when we get to the point of actually adopting, we need to make sure we give the public that same opportunity. So um, I think that we knew this was going to be a big project and it was going to take a while. So as expected. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I think we're good on uh, on policy and, and, and just for anyone watching the clock, we did hold back time with our expert and I think we have just enough time to finish up with agenda here unless Pat, you have anything to add on policy or where? Okay, nope, I, I feel good about that update. Um, <laughs> um, Terry. <laughs> Uh, item J1 um, has a resolution, and it's not numbered, but I'd like to read the number, and I'm not sure what number it should be for the year. Have we done any resolutions tonight? No. So we'd have to – it's the number after the number from the last agenda, and we'll do a motion to agenda, uh, amend the real quick. This is R31, so I'm thinking that should be R30. That would make sense. That would make sense. Um do we feel good about reading it in that way? Yeah, I think it's R30. Okay. Um, R30, be it resolved that the Board of Education designate the list of withdrawn library materials as presented to the library to be eligible for disposal in accordance with board policy. Um, can I have a motion? Questions or comments? My only comment is to say that we do this pretty frequently, um, library weeding. And Terry, can we, um, at the conclusion of the meeting or, or um, at some later date, can we get this list moved into uh, public content? We, we can do that after the meeting, right? It'll be done tomorrow, yes. Um, okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Give me a moment. I have a a child ringing. Uh, okay. K one. R thirty one. Be it resolved that the Board of Education accept consensus agenda J through L as written. Can I have a motion? All in favor? Uh, be any opposed? And so today was a pretty simple consensus agenda. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed questions or comments. Do you guys have any questions on this list? Okay, we are into... It was I, th J through L, huh? Yeah. No, we're in. Uh... Yeah, but there's no motion uh, number. So this it's is. Just, um, it's just future agenda items. No, but it was J. J K M wasn't included in the motion. Uh, in, in K1. Um, so I'm just going to do a... Um, <laughs> can I have a motion to amend the present agenda um, to add R32 to cover the M1 and 2? Motion. All in favor? Um, M, um, this would be... R32, be it resolved that the Board of Education accept consensus agenda M as written. 
All in favor? Okay, so we added 32 there. And we're into items for future agenda and we covered that one item from earlier in the meeting already. Does anyone have any other items for future agenda? Beth? We, we're we gonna have good news soon, right? Uh, we're gonna do an update on uh, the next board meeting for pre-K. Yeah, I'm excited about that one. Uh, we are into second public comment. So this is a public comment period for any members of the public to speak about um, any issue pertaining to the school district. Um, if anyone would like to speak, they can raise their, their digital hand. I don't think we have any, yep. well, we do have some public in the room. If anyone wants to speak on any issue, no, we don't have any public. Okay. Um, we have, we're now up to four members online. Uh, any digital hands? No digital. Okay. So we're gonna, with that, um, that's the end of our public agenda. Uh, we are gonna move into executive session um, to speak, uh, to discuss um, uh, proposed pending or current litigation. Um, so be it resolved that the board enter executive session. Can I have a motion? All in favor? Thanks, guys. Thank Motion to appoint uh, Salvador D'Angelo as district clerk pro tem for the executive session. Okay. All in favor? Thanks, Sal. And we are in.